Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another Shelby on Safari live stream in which I, Shelby, a wild animal biologist, Pokemon trainer, historian, pop culture fanatic, whatever you want to call me, all the many names I go by, look into the amazing world of animals and often combine them with pop culture, history, and whatnot. And tonight is no exception. We are going to be diving into the world of hares. And no, not these bad boys, but the adorable rodents that are rather mad this time of year. And looking into maybe the origins of certain phrases, some famous pop culture hairs, as well as bringing in some history. So it's a Shelby on Safari trifecta tonight. And as always, if you're joining me live or on the replay, please let me know in the comments. It's always nice to hear from you guys. And uh, also there'll be some pop quiz, pub quiz questions coming up as well, because I like to make it rather interactive. Oh, hello. Look who decided to bless us with her presence tonight. It's the fluffy angel, Kiana. Good Lord, we really have been blessed. Hello, did you want to say hi? Kiana's quite jealous that her brothers, Maui and Peter, have merchandise, but not Kiana. Um, and I along the lines of peasants, because that's what we all are compared to Kiana, isn't that right? Yes, Kiana's been rather naughty this week. She is rather picky about her food. She is on a food protest against the Pets at Home cat food brand that uh, I bought, and she uh, is not a fan. And so she's let me know that she's not been a fan. So I think that's why she came up. How weird. I'll, I'll take it. Uh, so yeah, if you, if you are new to the channel, I, uh, as a biologist, apparently am the home for misfit animals. Kiana was a rescue cat. Um, I have a few snakes, a couple lizards, all sorts of cool stuff, a lot of invertebrates. Uh, but yes, but alas, even though Kiana is uh, adorable beyond all reason, we are going to be looking instead at hares, the fun, fun rodents that uh, are rather mad this time of year. In particular, we're gonna go over quick kind of hair 101, looking at some of their biology and some cool facts that you may not know about them. We're also gonna be looking into the origin of the phrase mad as a March hare, before talking about the March hare in uh, Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, before talking a bit on hares and folklore, then wrapping it up with one of my favorite uh, characters in history, characters in history, one of my favorite people in history, and yeah, she certainly was a character, um, and her relation to hairs. So it is going to be a whirlwind of an evening, so it's time to get started. Again, if you're joining in the li uh, joining me live or in the replay, do drop me a message in the chat and let me know. So with regards to hairs 101, in fact, let me pull up my uh, nifty little slide here so you can see where you can find me across all variety channels of Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. And that's where you can find me. Uh, bada bing, bada boom. Let's move into some cool hair. So as always, I typically try to put up the scientific name with the animal as well, because it comes in quite handy with some species that uh, may have the same common name, but uh, are not the same species. And so it just helps. And so that's the usual one that I put towards the right hand side of the screen, the Lepis Europaeus. I'm pretty sure I butchered that saying, but we'll go with it because I said it with confidence. Um, but yeah, it, this is the brown hair, also known as the European hair. And uh, I thought I'd focus on this species. Uh, and you'll hear why in just a second. But I wanted to talk about if it actually, because it is called the European hair, but is it truly native to the UK? And I'd like to hear from you guys. Do you think true or false brown hairs were introduced to the UK? So were they brought over here or were they already native to the United Kingdom? I'd be keen to hear from you. So again, let me know in the chat what you think. Even if you're watching on replay, I know my friend Jody who watches the replay, she always lets me know as well. That makes me chuffed beyond all reason because it's nice to see. So what do you think, true or false? Brown hairs are introduced to the UK or not? True, true if you think they were introduced 
or false if you think, no, nah, mate, they've been here. They've been here all along. So I'll give you a few more moments before I tell you the answer because I don't want to give it away quite yet. Uh, okay, waiting. And yeah. so <laughs> it's actually true. And historians believe that the brown hair was introduced back in the Roman times or even earlier introduced to the United Kingdom. So now they're known kind of as naturalized because they've been here for quite some time. Um, and yeah, I thought that was rather interesting because they are quite common in folklore as we'll see throughout the United Kingdom and other parts of the world. But I was surprised to learn that they in fact are not a native species, but rather naturalized. So, oh, look at that cute face. Oh, they are so cute, so charismatic are the brown hairs. In fact, so charismatic, we're going to watch this one eat because it's so cute. Look at him nom. What the cutest little nomming you ever did see. And so while we're speaking of them nomming, I thought it'd be good to talk about what they like to eat. So they prefer farmland and woodland habitats, which actually is part of the reason that they're actually going into decline here in the United Kingdom. Their population is uh, just because of human encroachment. Uh, but as we see this one eating, uh, they prefer to eat vegetation, but also the bark of young trees and bushes, which I was quite taken aback by. But yeah, good old vegetation. Can't go wrong with a bit of veg, I suppose. In fact, I need to make some veg with dinner tonight. I'll probably make, I have some asparagus that I need to use and Brussels sprouts. I do like Brussels sprouts. I know that's a controversial topic because not everybody likes them, but I do like them. Whether steamed or covered in butter with bacon, that's fine too. I don't mind that. But yeah, Brussels sprouts. I'm a fan. I am a fan. Um, speaking of a fan, you would definitely need a fan to cool off after watching how fast these guys run. The Oh, we get to watch it again. How fabulous. No, I don't want to watch it nom again, although it's really cute. I want to know from you guys, uh, how fast do you think the brown hair can run. Now, rumor has it that uh, they are one fast runner. In fact, they've been de uh, declared Britain's fastest land mammal. So do you think the brown hair can run up to 30 miles per hour? Or is it B, up to 20 miles per hour? Or C, up to 45 miles per hour? Now, to put in perspective, the cheetah, uh, ranges from 65 upwards to 75 at most miles per hour, but obviously short distances. So what do you think about a cute little brown hair? Would it be A, 30, B, up to 20, or C, up to 45? And again, like, do let me know in the chat. Like, I do like hearing from you guys. Um, and it's nice to see all the pings come through of all the different guesses. So I'm going to tell you guys, it's actually C. The brown hair can run up to 45 miles per hour. Isn't that nuts? And uh, yeah, it's up to 45. So most of the time they might not be hitting that. But when they're trying to escape predators, they certainly can uh, and have been known to reach those speeds, which is absolutely crazy. However, that is not the craziest thing about our friend, the brown hairs. So little baby brown hairs called leveret, they can run within minutes of being born. Yeah, probably not going to be running up to 45 miles per hour after being born. But the last thing I would expect after being born is to be like, all right, time to get up, time to move. Um, where uh, it, that's one of the differences actually between them and rabbits. But we'll get to that in just a bit. But I thought that was nuts. <laughs> Welcome to the world. Time to run. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, we can talk about the differences between rabbits and hares now because we might as well, um, because it actually ties into the fact that they are runners. So hares, they have longer back legs, so that way they can move a lot faster. That comes in handy because rabbits, on the other hand, live underground in groups, whereas hares live above ground. And so, yes, sometimes they like duck into kind of like dips in the ground and like hide. Um, and avoid predators that way, but they don't go underground, whereas that's what rabbits do. So they need to be fast to avoid predators. And so that's 
one of the main differences. Also, hares have little um, kind of black tips at the end of their ears. But the biggest thing to tell the difference is, of course, the long legs, which are used for that running. So that was an ever so brief introduction into kind of hares and hares 101. The main thing of tonight, of course, is looking into hares in history and pop culture. And you might be thinking to yourself, why did Shelby call it March Madness? And I know we have March Madness like in basketball. They have, you know, all those different tournaments and things going on. Uh, but March Madness and kind of mad as a March hare has been a phrase that's been used for a very, very long time. Now, in fact, it was actually used more verbally uh, before actually being recorded. Um, and people believe, oh, let me put up a cute picture of a hare in the meantime, while I talk history. Um, the first kind of record of hares being kind of verbally discussed as mad as a March hare came around the 1500s. But later on uh, in Blobol's test, uh, a story titled, uh, well, not a story, a book that was about kind of early popular poetry of England in 1864. Um, I totally said that wrong. <laughs> can we edit that out? Oh wait, it's a live stream, we can't. Uh, Blobel's Test was a poem that was later reprinted in The Remains of Early Popular Poetry in England in 1864, there we go. And that was the first kind of proper record in writing of kind of March hares, madness, and whatnot. But actually, in this example, they're technically brainless. Now, I'm going to try to read it in Old English, and I'm still going to do my American accent, because if I do a British accent, yeah, it's going to be embarrassing either way. So it says in this poem, vain they began to swear and to stare, and be as brainless as a marsh Hair. Now, I said that funny because their spelling was weird. So like then, then, what we say then is spelled T-H-A-N-N-E. Uh, so yeah, it's spelled a bit differently. Uh, so in kind of modern English, it said, then they began to swerve and to stare and be as brainless as a marsh March hair, even though it says marsh, like marshland. Uh, so yeah, that was the first written record of kind of March hair kind of madness. And the reason why I was inspired to do tonight was because the other day on the way home from work, I was looking into the field. Don't worry, I wasn't driving. Um, but I was looking into the farmland fields off to the side. And I saw two big animals dashing about the field. And then one turned around and kind of looked to wallop the other. And I couldn't quite, because we were moving, I, I couldn't be like, stop the car. But it was pretty exciting because I, for a long, long time, have been dying to see hares in the wild. In fact, actually, a couple of months ago when my friend uh, had her birthday, she wanted to video, well, I wanted to do a video for her on hares. And I went out into the South Downs looking for a hare. And I did actually see one, but the footage is terrible, but I did see one. And so I was really excited because this was the second time in all my years of living in England that I saw some hares. And it got me thinking about this phrase and history and how hares have been in pop culture. Um, and so what I was lucky enough to witness was part of the reason why hares have this kind of weird phrase, mad as a March hare. And it's because March happens to be right. Maui, sorry, Kiana was hissing because Kiana's in the room and so is Maui and they're not friends. Can we get on for a second, please? I'm in the middle of a live stream. Don't be grumpy faces. So March is in the middle of the madness of the breeding season for the hares. Now, this typically means that, uh, you know, some of those male hares are on the hunt for some lady folk. Um, and they're actively seeking to mate with some female hares. Now, I have a question for you. Uh, sometimes, sometimes things happen during breeding season, you know, with other animals where you see, you know, males fighting over each other and whatnot. But when it comes to hares, and I hope that video actually played or else that was awkward. Um, if hares are boxing, so kind of what I saw where one of the hares turned around and hit the other one. 
and it's referred to as boxing because as you can see here, they're on their hind legs, they have their paws out and it looks like they're batting each other like in, their, in a boxing ring. Is it a male fighting another male or is it a female fighting a male? What do you guys think? As I break up, go on, get out of here, Maui. There we go, I broke up the fight. What do you guys think? Is it male versus male or male versus female when it comes to boxing time in March uh, for our wonderful brown hairs? Let me know, let me know. I'll give you a few moments to think about it because I could be giving you a trick question or it could be blatantly obvious. The choice is yours. Oh, <laughs> oh dear, it's my friend Freud. Uh, oh, how do you, <laughs> hello there. Are you Obi-Wan Kenobi? Oh my gosh, the Kenobi trailer looks amazing. I can't wait to see it. Um, how do you tell the difference between a rabbit and a hare? Ooh, I feel like you, this is, either on the cusp of a joke or a pretty obvious statement. Is it because of their long legs like we talked about earlier? No, it's probably not, it's probably a joke, but that's fine, that's fine. Tell me the joke, I will I will laugh at your joke, Freud. Um, <laughs> but the answer is actually, it's females versus males when it comes to the hairs boxing, which kind of throws some people for a loop because when you think of breeding season and fighting, it's often, you know, males fighting for dominance over males to have the right to breed. But with this case, it's the males chasing down the lady hairs and the lady hairs are over it. They say, nope, they don't want that kind of attention. And so she'll turn around and will wallop the male. Um, and yeah, like I said, it looks like they're boxing. So sometimes, you know, it's called hairs boxing and no, you find a hair on a person's head. Oh, well played, Freud. <laughs> well played. Yes, you would. Yes. And sometimes you might even find gray hairs on people's heads. Uh, but that's a topic for another night. Um, yeah, I just thought that was absolutely fun to discuss the boxing of the March hairs and the madness uh, that ensues within March of them chasing down each other. And sometimes it might be ending up in a boxing fight. And sometimes those boxing fights are pretty vicious because it has been noted that hair can be uh, pulled out. Hair, <laughs> hair, uh, I meant fur. Fur could be pulled out. There you go, Freud, you threw me off. You threw me off my groove uh, that fur can be removed during these boxing fights. So it can get quite intense. So now let's time to go to this lovely tale uh, in this illustration. Alice looks super grumpy. Like maybe she's just hangry. Maybe they needed to feed her some food. Like she looked really, really unhappy. In fact, she reminds me of me if I if I get too hungry without eating. Um, yes, hello, Kiana. So Alice's Adventure in Wonderland. Uh, so I thought I would bring up this one as an obvious pop culture reference because there are many iterations of Alice in Wonderland, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Alice. There's a variety of different names books, TV shows, movies, all that sort, right? And one of the key characters in the book, you could say, would be the March Hare. Now, not gonna lie, I'm a bit biased more towards the Mad Hatter. He's a bit more memorable a lot of the times I find, and I don't know why that is, but I found him to be much more memorable. But alas, they both have, you know, mad. And mad as a hatter is a totally different phrase that we would need to look on to in another uh, Shelby on Safari video. But mad as a March hare or March... Yes, Kiana. Sorry, she's being very needy tonight. Um, he's a part of the tea party as well. And of course, there's the Dora Mouse, which, by the way, if you haven't seen a video that my friend Alex Collins and I did on Dora Mouse and Dora Mice, if we're gonna be using proper English, but we're all mad here. Uh, the Dormouse video is super insightful and I really enjoy doing it. So I encourage you to check that out. I'll pop it down in the link in the description down below after this video or in the cards, if I remember, which you can click on up here. So the March hair, yeah, I don't know. I just didn't find him as memorable. And let me know in the chat, did you find him memorable? Do you prefer the Mad Hatter? Or do you prefer the Dormouse who's always sleeping at this tea party? I was surprised to find that Lewis Carroll uh, wrote that book back in 1865. Now, Alice Adventure, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland has quite the tie to the city Oxford, uh, one of my favorite cities. And I encourage you to learn kind of more about that 
Uh, I'll pop the links to that in the description below because we don't have time for that tonight, I'm afraid. But I wanted to mention the unpredictable manner of the March Hare. And sometimes in that scene, he has said, like, he can be quite rude, but he does make some good points to Alice, because to be fair, Alice is quite rude in that scene as well. And if you haven't read it, I encourage you to read it. It's a bit kind of all over the place, but part of the reason why it's all over the place is the unpredictable manner. And that got me thinking of hares and how they run kind of in an unpredictable manner when they're avoiding predators. They'll run in that kind of zigzag pattern to throw off the scent really of others. And so, it just, I don't know, Alice's Adventure in Wonderland is quite all over the place in terms of the dialogue. And it does, it's a really interesting book to read with regards to what was then kind of referred to as madness, or some people say kind of crazy. Um, and I, I don't know, I just found it really interesting with regards to a commentary kind of on mental health as well. And kind of, you know, they always say we're all mad here. And I guess it was nice to think of it from that sense, because I always grew up with like the Disney version. I was like, oh, they're just being quite silly. But then taking a second look at it and going, oh, they do cover some really kind of deep themes. It's kind of like an onion and not to quote Shrek. But I challenge you, if you haven't kind of read it or whatnot, go back and read it and think about it from that sense, because we see kind of the Mad Hatter, the March Hare, obviously the Queen's a bit cuckoo, kachoo. Um, but think of it from that site where, yeah, I don't know, it was just really deep. So I encourage you to check it out if you haven't uh, and have that mindset, especially of when he wrote it as well, like, because it was very much, you know, hush, hush, we don't talk about this. So I don't know, Prop, props to Lewis, man, props to Lewis. Hello, Rita. Hello, Al. Nice to see you guys. We've just been talking about hairs, March hairs, to be precise, because it is the season for March Madness. So I went through a bit of hair 101. And I'd be keen to hear from you, Rita and Alice, and any of you watching on the replay, what you guys think. And Freud, I don't think you answered either. But what you guys think, how fast the brown hair can run. Uh, do you think it's up to 20 miles per hour, 30 miles per hour, or 45 miles per hour? Let me know how fast you think they can run. And keep in mind, they are Britain's fastest land mammal. And the cheetah, the best animal alive, as we all know, can run up to speeds of 65, even sometimes reported 75 miles per hour. So let me know in the chats. Ah, uh, you are not named after Alice in Wonderland. Very good, very good. Um, and I hope you wouldn't because you don't remind me of her at all. I mean, look at that face, Alice, of Alice, of Alice in Wonderland. Like you have never made that face. Um, actually, no, you probably have at your brother but I lie. So yeah, you probably have, but you're not named after her. So that's good. But yeah, I just thought we'd discuss kind of March hair in terms of Alice in Wonderland. But now, as you guys know, I like to bring in other aspects other than folk culture, like history and folklore. And so my next two kind of topics of March hairs and madness, we're actually going to look into uh, hairs in folklore before going into hairs in history as well. Uh, oh, yes, I wanted to shout out to the Disney one because here it is. I love the Dormouse. I mean, the Mad Hatter is cool, um, but I purposely wanted to put this picture in because I'm so excited because in a few weeks time, I may be able to go back to California and I am so excited to get sick at Disneyland. Um, I will blatantly admit it here on YouTube that I, in my youth, I was able to handle the Mad Hatter's Tea Party ride multiple times in a row while frantically spinning the teacup. But now, uh, as I recently found out, my little sister has taken up the mantle and I, alas, cannot handle multiple rides in a row. She made me so sick. I was absolutely <laughs> in a terrible place on our drive home after leaving Disneyland uh, after being on that ride with her about three times. I think I could stand three times in a row. Uh, so we'll see if I can get the record of four times on a row with my littlest sister. 
Um, my middle sister played it clever and didn't go on with us. <laughs> but yeah, maybe maybe I'll have to see if she can handle it. Hello, you are the little mousy. Oh, you're the you're the dormouse. You're always sleeping. You're always falling asleep in places, Freud. Is that right? Oh, he he is rather sweet, the little dormouse. You know, actually, this is rather embarrassing, but I feel like I can be honest with you guys. I feel like I can trust you. I never knew when I was little watching this kind of what the dormouse was because we don't really have them in the States. And so I was kind of like, oh, it's a little mouse sleeping. But now knowing, and thanks to that collaboration with Alex Collins, it's a bit more obvious now about the dormouse and why um, it's always sleeping. And uh, yeah, actually, Speaking of Dormouse, because I have Dormouse on the brain, uh, the enclosure at New Forest Wildlife Park for their Dormouse um, exhibit was fantastic. And I'll try to share a picture of it on my Instagram later after this, but it's a bunch of really like little houses and an intricate place for them to sleep, but also like really interesting kind of climbing apparatuses for them to use and whatnot. And it was just a really cool enclosure. I really enjoyed it. And not just the enclosure, but they do great conservation work as well. I follow them on Instagram and they're frequently sharing what they've been up to in terms of releasing kind of dorm mice back into the wild with their sister zoo, Battersea Park. So yeah, shout out to them. Great job with the Native Species Conservation guys. Well done. All right, so before I get more distracted and going off on tangents, I thought it would be interesting to talk about hares and folklore. And here's a cool little video of a hare running because uh, like the March hare, and the dialogue going all over the place. And apparently, like myself, the dialogue zigzagging all over the place. Here's March Hare uh, running. I don't know if it was in March, but he was running in a zigzag pattern. So hairs in folklore. Now, one of the things I know my friends, uh, Al and Rita are fri <laughs> friends of Harry Potter, not personal friends, but they are fans of Harry Potter because I can speak correctly. And uh, of course, hairs in terms of the magical sense, we think of Luna Lovegood and her Patronus. But I kind of was wondering about that connection between hairs and magic. And it turns out that there's a lot, a lot of folklore regarding humans transforming or being transformed into hairs. Uh, a lot of them ended up being witches, which made me think, of course, of Luna Lovegood. Um, but one particular tale, <laughs> a poor woman was transformed and some could say cursed into being a hare. It's in an old Scottish tale called Thistle and Time. And a woman was turned into a blue eyed hare by a witch. Now, at first glance, I think actually that would not be the coolest thing to be turned into a hare. However, upon reflection, seeing as how fast they are, um, and of course seeing how, <laughs> I love how the female hairs box the male hairs away. I have props to them. Uh, yeah, being done chased, Pff, right, uh, right, give them the old right, left jab. Uh, I don't think it would be that bad. I think there would be worse animals to be turned into. Um, and let me know, oh, Katie coming in with hair today, gone tomorrow. Oh boy. And Sheldon, do you like hairs? I, I do like hairs. I, I enjoy seeing them in the wild and I wouldn't be that sad if I was turned into a hair by a witch. Uh, but yeah, let me know in the chat. Would you want to be turned into a hair by a witch? Like if you had to be turned into an animal as punishment. I don't know what this woman did to upset this Scottish woman. I'll be real. I didn't read Thistle and Thine, the old Scottish tale. But I imagine she must have done something to upset this witch and thus be turned into an animal and specifically a hair. But yeah, let me know in the chat what animal you would want to be turned into, if not a hair. I probably wouldn't go with the hair as my first choice though. It'd probably be an otter. Yeah, yeah, it'd be an otter. All right, so unsurprisingly, also given their speed, as we've seen in that video and how fast they can run of up to 45 miles per hour, hares also have quite the connection to uh, being kind of messengers of the gods and whatnot and kind of taken for omens perhaps, which we'll talk about in a bit more. But I thought that was pretty cool to see them associated with kind of messages and whatnot and sometimes uh fire as well and fire might kind of seem a bit odd but hairs kind of in those fields so say if someone um you know was out to burn that field the hair because they don't go underground remember like rabbits they kind of hide themselves in like little dips in the ground and little ditches 
and whatnot, and they'll flatten themselves. And if, say, a farmer is burning his field for whatever reason, or there's wildfire, the hare will try to stay hidden for as long as possible. And then if the fire gets like too close and the hare's like, okay, I got to bounce, then they'll jump. And it almost I imagine to some might look like they're jumping from the flames and running. So yeah, I thought that was a bit interesting. I would not have normally associated hairs with fire, but there we go. Uh, but I do want to give a shout out to some interesting hairs from across the world in terms of folklore. Uh, while I will focus on the history figure, uh, one of my favorites from here in the UK in just a bit, I wanted to mention the great hair from the Algonquin tribe of North America. Now, this great hare in legend uh, was the one who brought summer uh, to defeat winter. Now, this great hare goes by the name of Misha Bose, which is pretty cool name to begin with, but also pretty cool that they brought summer to defeat winter. I mean, you can't get much better than that. And if you are in the UK today, I don't know, I hope you guys have all had a chance to go outside. It was absolutely stunning. Like I wore a dress and I was starting to get a little toasty. Like it's almost short season. It is. In fact, one might say I could wear shorts tomorrow. I think I might actually, because it's actually warm. It's exciting, very exciting. Uh, but yeah, thanks to the great hair from the Algonquin tribe for bringing that. What a pretty cool uh, thing to do. Now, in terms of pretty cool things to do, there was a tale from India of a clever hair. So sometimes hairs get a bad reputation um, and Sometimes they're kind of quite lofty and aloof and whatnot. But this particular hare from India really got to show off its cleverness. And, you know, there's the tortoise and the hare and Aesop's fables and all of that. But this one apparently tricked a lion. Now, this lion, uh, bear with me, uh, was quite rude. And he was going around mercilessly killing these animals in this forest. And everyone was kind of afraid of him. And when I say the lion was killing them, I should clarify, it wasn't for food for him to eat. It was just for sport, for fun. And so all the animals were a bit afraid. They didn't know what to do. The lion was threatening them like, oh, I'm going to kill you, rah, rah, rah. And this hare took matters into his own paws. And this hare apparently told the lion, hey, there is another lion out there who is threatening your territory and wants to come take over the forest, you know, take over all these animals. And I realized that my internet <laughs> is glitching crazy. I hope you can still hear me. Hopefully you can still, still. Sorry, guys. I don't know what's going on with the internet. Um, but this hair eventually kind of persuaded the lion to follow this hare because the hare was going to lead him to this home of this other, you know, terrible lion that threatened this crazy lion's home, right? And so he built up this image of this castle and whatnot. And, oh, you got to be really afraid. He's going to take over. And this castle that this hare led him to, it made me well. And he was like, hey, you need to look in here and check out this line. Like, he's gone to hide down here. Like, be careful. And the lion peeks his head in and sees his reflection on the water of the well down below and thinks it's actually another lion. And so he roars to, you know, scare this other lion away. But, of course, because it's a well, it echoes. And so our actual lion thinks, whoa, this is one powerful lion. I got to sort matters out. I'm going to get down there and defeat him. And he jumps into the well and, well, he's never here from again. Uh, he meets his demise at the bottom of the well. And so the hare, in a quite clever trick, saved the forest and saved all the animals. So, yeah, well done. Well done, little hare, for tricking a scary lion. Um very interesting tale, to say the least, of a hare being rather clever. And there's a cool picture of them boxing. So like we know, it's a female batting and doofing up, as we like to say, <laughs> a male that was chasing her to mate during their breeding season, which coincides with the month of March. March ends up being right in the middle of the hare's breeding season, the brown hare, to be precise or known as the European hare. Now, the star of tonight, my favorite story that I've been most looking forward to sharing with you guys, is around one of my favorite, favorite people in history. She is quite 
the legend to be precise. Um, and I call her Boudicca, but apparently other people refer to her as Boudicca. And uh, tomato, tomato, Boudicca, Boudicca, whatever you want to call her, she is really cool. And if you're not familiar with kind of British history, uh, I don't blame you. There's a lot, a lot of years of British history. Uh, but our friend uh, Boudicca was queen of the Iceni tribe. So this is going back before the Romans, well, actually not before the Romans, but before the Romans became like the big kahuna Romans, right? So they were kind of just starting to take over at this point. And of course there were native uh, tribes here on the UK, uh, throughout the UK. And the Iceni tribe was one of that. In fact, their lands were Norfolk area. And yeah, I said that weird, but I'm American, so I can get away with it. Uh, but they're from <laughs> that part of the UK. And unfortunately, when Boudicca's husband died, so he was kind of the ruler of the lands. And at the time, with the Romans kind of beginning to take over, if the kind of uh, vessel ruler, so Boudicca's husband, if he died, then kind of Rome would take the lands and wouldn't be passed down. But her husband wasn't happy with that. And he tried to bequeath his lands to his daughters. And because uh, they had quite a few daughters, not any sons. And the Romans weren't having it. They were like, no, it's our land. Like, nah. -uh. And poor Boudicca protested. And when she did, that wasn't good because the Romans weren't happy that a woman was standing up to them and they were like, nope, sorry, we're going to have to embarrass you now. Um, so they flogged her and then they raped her daughters in front of her, which is pretty hardcore to say the least. And Boudicca didn't take lightly to that, uh, as I can imagine most of us wouldn't. Um, but Boudicca did something about it. She didn't just kind of sit around. She took matters into her own hands. And what was then known and still known as Boudicca's revolt kind of started. It, it And it wasn't just the Iceni tribe either. There was a few other tribes across kind of the um, what is now England that kind of came together to try to uh, take it to the Romans we should say, uh, quite <laughs> diplomatically. Yes, Kiana, we see you. And yes, you are beautiful like Boudicca. Um, yeah, she's causing trouble tonight. So I'm going to tell you about a time date. So it's either around 60 or 61 AD. Now those dates are important because we'll find out why in just a bit. So that's when kind of roughly the revolt started to happen. And again, with other tribes involved, they began to go and, well, how should I say this, destroy Roman towns. Uh, the first place the British rebels went to was, in fact, the Roman colony of Colchester, uh, which, if you haven't been to Colchester, they have a great zoo, uh, but also very cool castle and very, very, very much full of history, such as this. Uh, but unfortunately, their history when it came to being ransacked by the British uh, rebels is a bit sad because they were destroyed. Um, and the Iceni tribe and the other tribes that came together for kind of Boudicca's revolt, they didn't really have any mercy towards the Romans and those that lived within kind of the Roman walls of these colonies. They came, they saw, and they conquered, quite literally, destroying the towns, killing people who were in they had no mercy. Um, and in fact, the next stop on their rampage was a city you may know, uh, Londinium, the Roman city of Londinium, which of course is now known as London. And when they went there, they too destroyed within the Roman walls, everybody who was in there and burnt it down. And in fact, uh, you can still see today, uh, thanks to modern archaeology, going down quite a bit away in London's uh, soil, you can see there's actually a thick red layer of burnt debris covering like pottery and coins and things like that, that dates from before 60 AD. So there's actual archaeological, uh, what one can assume as evidence towards that Boudicca revolt line of burning down London, which I find absolutely crazy. Obviously quite sad, but 
pretty cool that we can see evidence of that for sure. Um, and you can see here actually uh, in this picture, which I've had up for quite some time, is we have the uh, tower where Big Ben, the bell is kept, but just uh, outside of Big Ben, right next to the River Thames, is this statue of Boudicca or Boudicca. And you can see there's actually a couple figures. There's the horses, but then the figure closest to us is actually one of her daughters. And then Boudicca is the one standing up with her hands up, which is quite cool. Um, and I thought that's rather ironic that in the city that they burnt down <laughs> in Boudicca's revolt, uh, there's a statue of her. But you'll see why, because it kind of stands for kind of British, uh, you know, standing up for what's right and whatnot. I guess a lot of people look up to her, as they should, because she she did, you know, she tried her hardest to stand up for what she thought was right kind of thing. Um, but that's not where the trouble ended. I can assure you they went to another city um, to destroy it and bring havoc to our friends or lack thereof, the Romans. I want to know. So the first city they went to, uh, to their colony that they destroyed was Colchester. The second one was Londinium or London. What was the third Roman town to be destroyed? Technically, was it A, St. Albans, B, Winchester, or C, Bristol? Let me know what <laughs> would you say? And I've just seen the chat. Alice would like to be a cat. Rita would like to be an ant. What kind of ant? Like a fire ant? A leaf cutter ant? You got to be specific, Rita. You got to be specific. What kind of ant? Uh, but yes, what do you guys think? And I have put a hint to which city it is in the picture. It's a quite obvious hint if you're a fan of your cathedrals here of the UK. Um, is it A, St. Albans, B, Winchester, or C, Bristol? A, D, Milton Keynes. Hello, Julie. I didn't see a D on there, but uh, well played, well played, Milton Keynes. All right. All right. I'm glad nobody Winchester because that's in, not Winchester Cathedral. Um, and no, that is not Bristol Cathedral. And in fact, you are right, Katie. St. Albans is the third city that Boudicca, Boudicca actually destroyed. Ah, Rita said B. You silly Rita. It is not Winchester, but St. Albans. Now, here is the thing. You guys are probably like, all right, great. Shelby's talking about Boudicca. She's this crazy lady who's out for revenge. What's the deal with hairs? Well, it turns out that the Iceni tribe, so Boudicca's tribe, performed sacrifices to the Celtic goddess of revenge because as you can guess it Boudicca wanted revenge for what they did to her and her daughters and everything that they've done against kind of the Iceni tribe and the other Britons uh and this Celtic goddess of revenge Androste uh happens to have a connection to hares so the hare is actually considered sacred to her um, and, uh, yeah, so what does one do with a hair who is sacred? So apparently before a battle, and I'm not sure quite which battle it was, and of course at this point it's kind of all hearsay in terms of it, but I'd like to think this is actually what Boudicca said. Um, it was written and suggested that Boudicca said before a battle, let us therefore go against them, referring to the Romans, trusting boldly to good fortune let us show them that they are hares and foxes trying to rule over dogs and wolves dogs and wolves alluding to them the iceni tribe and the other native britons and the hares and foxes being our uh roman uh the roman people now ironically after she said this she then released a hair from her gown which makes me think how would she keep a hair in her gown? Like that would be rather uncomfortable, but <laughs> apparently she did. Well done, Boudicca. Uh, and they used how the hair ran and which direction the hair ran as a form of divination to see if it would be kind of favorable to go into battle or not so favorable to go into battle. And you guessed it because of the uh, ever, uh, I guess, mistrusting of the left hand side that was considered unfavorable if the hair went in that direction 
but more favorable if it went to the right hand side. And so, yeah, the hair went to the right hand side. And so, yeah, she trusted the judgment of the hair and led them into battle um, and whatnot. So yeah, Boudicca relying on hairs of all things. So hairs have a very interesting history of being used and associated with magic, people turning into hairs. We see Matt as a March hare, so that uh, kind of kooky behavior that you might see them doing in the evenings as the days get longer, males chasing females, trying to mate with them, and then the females boxing to say, no mate, not today, kind of thing. It, it's very interesting to see how animal behavior has woven its way into history in terms of also pulp culture and whatnot. So that was just a bit of a whirlwind tour of some cool hairs throughout history and uh, some hair 101 on this Shelby on Safari live stream. So I encourage you guys to also let me know, what is this? Oh, I have a video of a hair, but you, you, you've seen lots of videos of hair. I want you to tell me in the comments, what's your favorite hair in pulp culture? Are you a fan of the March hair from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, which as we know, Alice is not named after Alice in Wonderland. Is it Luna Lovegood's hair? Is it the tortoise in the hair from Aesop's Fables? I was trying to think because there's more rabbits in pulp culture than hares, I would say. Um, I'm not sure why that is, if it's just because rabbits are more common or whatnot. I don't know. What do you guys think? I don't know. I just, there's not many hares. Or maybe because hares, I don't know. Deep thoughts, deep thoughts. But let me know in the comments what your favorite hair from pulp culture is. And uh, while you do, I do encourage you guys to check out over on my socials if you haven't already, because on Instagram, I'm most active there and often share behind the scenes. And so to say like tomorrow, when I may be going uh, into a place that our friend Boudicca ransacked and burnt down, you can come along with me. <laughs> and uh, I will not be finding the red uh, layer of fire debris from Boudicca's revolt in Londinium, uh, although that would be really cool. I'll be going somewhere else tomorrow, uh, and actually a place that I mentioned quite early on in tonight's live stream. So very excited, and hopefully you guys can uh, follow me along there. If not, if you can't follow me on Instagram, you'll see where I get up to in a upcoming week's video. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Ah, Alice likes the March hair. Alice, I would like to battle. <laughs> You'd go into battle with Boudicca. Actually, like if you could get a time machine, I bet it would be super gnarly. Like, not gonna lie. Like, just of the standard of living, you know, the um, how life was at that time. I bet it would be pretty gnarly. But if you had a time machine, say like the TARDIS, and you could like pop in, watch, and like I don't know. I bet Boudicca would have been quite. The person to behold. Like rumor has it, um, she's been described as being tall, fierce, with a stern kind of uh, stern set eyes and whatnot. I think she would have been quite impressive to have seen in person, uh, frankly. But then I would quickly want to go back in my TARDIS and go to another time. I wouldn't want to hang around for long uh, in Celtic and slash Roman Britain. No, thank you. No, thank you, Katie. Uh, but yes, with that, guys, thank you so much for joining me on the live stream. Thank you for tagging along. I know it was a bit different of a time. I've been playing around with the live stream times and dates lately. So I appreciate you guys tagging along. As always, if you watch the replay, let me know in the comments, like my friend Jody does. But uh, this week, Friday, uh, will be a surprise video of what you will encounter. So if you haven't, subscribe already to join the safari. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining me and I will see you in Friday's video or if I remember to put the cards in, the video right here, which I don't know which one I'll put. Which one should I put? Oh, I should probably put the hair video that I did before about hairs being magical. So go on, click that video. Um, and if you're watching live, you're gonna think I'm crazy or am I mad? But that's all right, because we're all mad here. Have a good night, guys. Bye.